Welcome back to this Sunday's Off the Ball. I'm Ellen Keane, Irish Paralympic swimmer and Sky Sports scholar. Coming up over the next hour, I'll be chatting to ultra runner Conor O'Keefe about taking on an incredible endurance challenge. But our first guest today is sports columnist Joanna Rudin. Joanne, welcome. How are you, Ellen? I'm good. I have a question for you. So you are sporting some fabulous glasses, as you always are. And I do my best. I wear contact lenses. And today is the first day in a very long time that I've worn my glasses and I was wearing my mask earlier and I literally couldn't see anything. My glasses just fogged up so much. So how how are you surviving? I um I've never seen you with glasses, like in all the years I know you. So I'm like, is that Ellen? Um but yeah, no, I these glasses now in particular, these are my nerd glasses, is what I call them. So I actually normally only wear these if I'm on the, the computer. Um, if you and know you're going to be on the screen. screen. Yeah, basically, just so I can look a little bit intelligent. But these glasses actually sit over the mask whenever I'm wearing a mask. But I was talking to a guy, um, his name is Owen Burns. He basically is um, a breathing coach. So he helps athletes and people who are suffering with anxiety, um, snoring and like any kind of breathing issues, um, how to breathe again, basically. And the idea is that you're not supposed to breathe uh, through your mouth. You're only supposed to breathe through your nose and keep your mouth closed at all times. So he was saying that like when you breathe with a mask, um, it's 46% moisture because obviously there's no filters like the hairs in your nose to filter it. And uh, yeah, he basically said, when you breathe out of your mouth with a mask, 46% of the moisture goes up and that's why your glasses get like steamed up. So he was basically saying like that breathing, it's all like kind of mental kind of stuff. So um, yeah, basically anytime you breathe, it's to be conscious to breathe through your nose um, at all times. And yeah, that was really it. That was the only thing I took away. I tried it in the shop and it actually worked. So he does know what he's talking about, can confirm. <laughs> That is so useful. I'm going to try that out now. Just be a bit more conscious of my, my breathing techniques. Says the swimmer, like. <laughs> but the thing is with swimming, I find you, you train your body so much to not breathe or to breathe out really slowly. So what I actually do is the opposite. I hold my breath a lot and then I forget yeah. that I haven't taken a breath. And then I kind of have to take loads of breaths or just like one big sigh. And it's when yeah, I do yeah. that big sigh that my glasses have just fogged up there you go through the nose if you possibly can through your nose and yeah it's all about focusing on your exhale as much as your inhale apparently so yeah be a bit more present there you go how is uh how is cork treating you how was how's your day going things are going well um it's been pretty busy obviously with the writing and stuff in general um i was saying it to a friend of mine that even though i've remained in my study at all times um i think i've been around the world like in terms of doing interviews and stuff um, you know, we've been very lucky. We got to interview um, Pele's daughter, Kelly Nascimento de Luca, and her football film about women in sport. Um, and in football in particular, we got to interview Hannah Gordon. She's the legal officer basically for the San Francisco 49ers. Um, and actually, her interview came at a really good time because it was during the um, Black Lives Matter movement. Obviously, this is still going on in America. And given everything that's going on with the 49ers and Colin Kaepernick and everything else, it was just a really kind of interesting interview to see how the organization works during a very tumultuous time so that was really fun but overall Cork has been fine you know I went to two football games and then everything shut down um so I've just been at home baking cookies um like any good grandmother um and uh, yeah I accidentally baked three dozen I thought it said a dozen so now we've got uh, 36 cookies just lined up on like over by the oven and my mom's currently having nerves breakdown as to like when do we eat these cookies. How many people are in your house? There's three of us. <laughs> Maybe you should just freeze them and then take them out every month or something. I think that's going to have to happen. I think that's going to have to happen. I mean, originally I just drop them at like whatever training or whatever's going on or if my nieces were over. Um so I'm going to have to bribe a few of the young ones in the estate, not in a weird way, but I'm going to have to, you know, um, tell them, you know, I've got a load of cookies, I'll give them to you and you can leave my house again. Thanks. God bless. <laughs> that sounds very suspicious. <laughs> I know. I was, as I was talking there, I was like, you've studied criminology, Joanne. This isn't, this isn't the type of conversation you want. But you're a competitive girl. So would you not just challenge yourself to see how much, how many cookies you can eat? Do a challenge. It's all over Instagram at the moment, so... Oh, like my, I can eat a whole Kinder Egg in 10 seconds. That's my, 
bucket list job done. I don't um, believe it. I don't know if that's I don't know if that's healthy. I like I feel like I'm going to be judged for the rest of my life. Um, but I'm going to try with the cookies. Um, I'm going to try. I've been trying. This is going to sound even worse. I've been obviously trying to like be healthier with my lifestyle choices. Um, like because I do yoga every morning now, and uh, yeah, I don't think eating like three dozen cookies is going to be the best way to combat my current gut scenario. My my lockdown gut. Yeah, but it's a lockdown diet. Everyone has one. <laughs> I'm glad the athlete tells me this. <laughs> I'm currently doing my thesis at the moment and whenever I'm like doing um, academic work or like just, you know, that like pressure to kind of stress out, my appetite is so weird. I get such weird cravings. So, oh, yeah. and because I'm on my time off at the moment as well, my focus isn't on eating around training. So now I'm just kind of eating anything I want because I know when I go back to training as well I'll be able to to work it all off but I'm having some weird eating some weird things so I completely I completely support it go for it do the challenge definitely uh well these are old cookies you know they're like kind of the the hobnobby kind of vibes that I kind of went for this time um Um, yeah I don't know how you're into hobnobs but uh no it's not that it's just I'm concerned about the challenge because if you if you're going to over consume too many oats, you'll probably explode. <laughs> I was thinking that I don't think I'm like a horse or whatever animal eats a lot of oats. I don't think I'm that level. <laughs> let's uh, let's talk about your yoga. When did you start? Yeah, so I've been doing yoga for over a year now, actually, like classes wise. Um, and uh, yeah, it's been really fun and really challenging. So uh, for anyone who doesn't know, I was uh, born with scoliosis as well as having no limbs. And um, I have a titanium rod um, basically holding me up at the minute. Um, so like you can obviously see by the picture, like I'm a little bit slouched and a little bit tossed over to the right hand side because um, my back goes in a C um, to the left hand side. Basically, there's a football in my back, as my dad likes to tell me. Um, and uh, yeah, so... I kind of got that operation when I was 16 and I used to swim, uh, not to your level, but uh, I used to swim uh, four times a week, ironically enough. And uh, after my operation, I stopped. Other than that, I'd obviously have won Paralympic gold. Duh. Um, Here, no. <laughs> you and I have had this chat, Paris 2024, I'm telling you. It's going to happen. It's going to happen. But uh, yeah, so then I kind of lost all kind of ability to kind of move for myself and balance was a huge thing for me. I couldn't sit anywhere independently. I constantly had to have something like under my arms to kind of keep me supported. And I suppose last year I kind of decided this is just not as fun as what it used to be. You know, if I was like at a friend's house and I wanted to come out of the chair and sit on their couch, you'd have to sit up like, you know, they called it my cocoons, um, literally on the side of someone's couch. I just would like a, a blockade of pillows around me. And uh, I just kind of didn't really want that anymore. And I rang a yoga teacher in Cork and uh, he was happy enough to take me on. Yeah, so about a year now doing that. And it's kind of funny because, um, you know, obviously yeah, height-wise, I'm never going to change. But because of like the stretching that I'm doing to keep my back kind of nice and stable, I've actually gained an inch that I never had before. So Ooh. yeah, it's, it's been wild. It's been an experience. But uh, yeah, now, now it's just about kind of keeping you know, keeping flexible and just keeping the ability to move. But definitely now I can stand by myself um, completely independent. No one needs to be around me. Um, and I I can, you know, shuffle away like across the mat, no bother, um, and just do my stretches. So, yeah, it's fine. That's so exciting that you were able to kind of undo all the kind of negatives that you were seeing happen. Yeah, like for sure. Like I didn't really think it was possible. Like I kind of thought the titanium rod was just going to hold me and that was, it was just going to hold me forever. Like, look, obviously I know after the back operation, you know, you obviously had to do your physio and, you know, stuff like that. And I think you just, it's like kind of any operation or any injury or anything like that that you, you take, you're like, you're not mentally there to be ready to do physical activity. I think you have to do it kind of when you're feeling it. Yeah. Um, and I definitely wasn't feeling it then. Like I wasn't feeling like my best self definitely from, you know, 16 to about 18, 19. And it was only kind of around 19. I kind of decided this isn't working for me anymore. But I think what upset me more than anything else was the fact I couldn't swim properly again. Um, like I thought, like I can swim completely independently. You know, um, we always joke in my family, I'm a one of five and it's four older than me. And we always joke um, that if anyone was to kind of drown tomorrow morning, 
I'd be the only one that could save you because none of them actually learned how to swim. Um, and I don't really know what it'd be like for a limbless person to jump in after you if you're drowning. You'd probably be like, this has to be like, I'm getting punked. Um, You'll just lie yeah. on your back and then they can just like hold on. And you That's can just what wiggle. I was thinking. That's what I was thinking. Or they could just you know, grab me by the ponytail. It'll be totally fine. Um, I'll just trail them along. But yeah, uh, once then I kind of got back into the pool and I wasn't really as competitive as what I used to be and I kind of realized that I could half do a butterfly again. Then I kind of realized, look, it's up to me if I want to be able to hop back in a pool. And just, it, it wasn't actually being in the pool. It was being more independent and being able to sit by yourself without having someone set up uh, a full-on, like, you know, the shelter so you didn't fall and off the couch and smash your head off the ground. Because, like, when I was younger, like, I was jumping off the couch, kamikaze onto mattresses and body slamming myself, like, and frog splash in WWE terms. Um, so, yeah. I think that's such an um, important thing to realise. I think it's really hard to do something, especially when you're a person with a disability, it's really hard to follow kind of what people are telling you to do because they're the ones telling you what to do. And you kind of feel like, it's not your choice. It's not your decision. It wasn't your choice or decision to be born like this. And then yeah. you're being told all these extra things that you have to do. And it's something that you kind of have to find yourself. You have to want to, don't you? Exactly. Like, like as you were saying, like, I wasn't born without being able to balance. Like, that just happened to be my scenario. And as you were saying, like, you can get incredibly down in the dumps and be like, well, this is my situation. Like, tough. You know, I just got to, you know, just kind of, upset yourself and kind of put yourself down a bit further and like don't get me wrong like I definitely was not putting myself down but like you'd kind of look at yourself in the mirror and you'd be like why like why can't you do it like just what's wrong with you and it was just to kind of get that maybe conversation going in your brain not to put yourself down but just to kind of ask yourself like what barriers are you putting in place that you don't want to do it um and as you said like sometimes like even in yoga like it's funny when they're like oh do this twist and I'm like kind of doing the twist and obviously I'm uber competitive and I see like legs and arms going like don't get me wrong and you know like it looks better with the legs and arms going so I'm like looking going I need to be at their level and I remember like a footballer like he's a friend of mine he plays with the club here and he was like you're doing it he was like the problem is that you're measuring as if you had legs he was like you literally have like your ass and that's it he was like so obviously when they say hips up like your hips are going up Joanne it's just you see someone with a leg up in the air he's like that's the difference you know that's why you don't think you're doing it so eventually kind of once he explained to me about anatomy and how it works um I think then I kind of stopped thinking comparing myself to others and just kind of went with it and rolled with it but you know as I was saying to like my mother last night like I definitely noticed a huge difference be it in like mental health is obviously so important like I'm definitely a little bit more happier than what I would be um than normally um and I think it's just it's a pause and a reset for me that I never kind of gave myself definitely in the last 24 years anyways that's class that's really good to hear and really in, like I hate saying this word but it, it is inspiring like I hate using that word with yeah. people with disabilities but it's not that it's inspiring because you're disabled it's more inspiring because you recognize something that wasn't working for you and just, you decided to make a change about it so that's that's really good to hear and especially that it's working yeah, exactly. I mean, imagine if I came on to you and I was like, that is a fiddle after having like 20 million cookies. <laughs> um, so let's talk about Tokyo. You and I have had private conversations about possibly being in Tokyo. Um, is the it, is it goal to go to Tokyo for like being journalist in Tokyo? Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, for me, it's, I think it would be like such a cool thing like if you know RT or you know any kind of company were to like send someone out because I think you know sports is obviously hugely important and I think we've seen that in Ireland like across the board for sure and um, definitely during this pandemic but I think what people get lost in is that you can also be involved in sport but not be the athlete and I think that's something that a lot of people still don't understand like sure it's great to be the athlete and definitely for sure like if you were to offer me a place in Tokyo as an athlete or as a normal person I'd be like definitely an athlete like I want to win a gold medal but you just have to kind of accept and understand that like maybe that's just not for you but you can definitely do other things um and I suppose I was always mad into writing kind of growing up and I loved telling people stories and I loved the whole idea that 
you had the power to give someone a voice that never would have had a voice before. And I thought that was hugely interesting to me that it was so powerful. Um, so the idea then about going to Tokyo, look, I always wanted to go to an Olympics and a Paralympics, don't get me wrong. And because obviously Ireland is super successful at the Paralympics anyways, I thought these are such great stories to tell. Like why, why aren't a lot of, you know, mainstream media not telling them, you know, and like, you know, your good self is obviously, you're obviously doing incredible work to showcase all the good work being done. Um, and you know yourself that there are such incredible people on your team alone, you know, um, and like, you'd love to kind of get their story, not just their stories, but like their, their talents and their attributes and everything they can put into society out there for people to see. Um, so yeah, I definitely like, it would be a huge, you know, goal and milestone for me. Like, don't get me wrong, but you know, it's, it's, it's probably up to the powers that be, you know, for me, like, it's definitely not like if it was my choice, I'd be on the plane right now. <laughs> well, not right now. You wouldn't really want to be on the plane right now, would you? <laughs> no, 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 no. no. So probably not going anyways. So clearly you're super passionate about sport and it's it's so lovely to hear a journalist who's so passionate about sport like that's that's the person that you want to tell your story what sort of role did sport play in your life as a child or a teenager Um for me going up it was or growing up it was about um the friends that I made um the community the involvement the idea that you're a part of something because you know human conditioning 101 like is that you have to have connections and you have to have a purpose and I think sport gives you both you have obviously the purpose to win or do your best depending on what your talents are and then you also have the community around you like fair enough you're an individual sport but even you'll say that there's a community around you from like coaches to trainers to colleagues to everyone else you know um and I think that's what I love the most about sport and I think during lockdown we kind of saw like the best of it you know I know myself like I was you know, involved in a in a FIFA online charity tournament and I got a load of GA players to sit down and play FIFA over the Maybank holiday to raise money, you know, to get PPE into um, essential um essential workers and things like that. Um and that was mainly just because I, you know, saw how the connections that I had through sport alone. Like I had so many outlets to be like, oh, cool, I'll just email this person and kind of hope for the best, you know? Um, and yeah, I think just to see how like over a hundred people, like players volunteered their time and their hours to say, oh yeah, sure, I play FIFA. I'd love to do it. No bother, Joanne, I'll play FIFA. And all of a sudden you've created like this mini community of FIFA players. And as they said themselves, like they don't have time obviously during training and stuff. So it was good for them to pick up their skills. Um, but I think, as I said, like it's just that to have that connection and to have that purpose um, in your life, I think is, is the most important thing. And sports definitely gave that for me. Um, and I always knew that I couldn't kick a ball. Sure, don't get me wrong. I couldn't run with my peers um, and I couldn't be everyone else. But the whole idea of like, it's it's about the attitude you bring to a game or a race or anything like that. I really did enjoy that because I do think a lot of the stuff that you kind of go through in life, it is probably 80 to 90 percent mental and it's your attitude towards that what's get is what gets you through it um and yeah i really enjoy that and then on the flip side as i said i love to write and i love just um telling telling stories and i just thought why not try your hand at it and see what you can do so hopefully i'm doing an okay job people are telling me their articles are fine I don't know. <laughs> well, I think you're doing a great job, jo Joanne. It was great to have you on the show today. Thank you so much for joining me. Cheers. Thanks a lot for having me. I hope to see you in Tokyo next year. We'll start a campaign, get Joanne to Tokyo. We're, we're going to hang out. We're <laughs> going to be there and we're going to break all the rules. It'll be fine. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> <laughs> that was sports writer Joanna Reardon. Coming up after the break, I'll be speaking to ultra runner Connor O'Keefe. We'll be back in a moment. Welcome back to Off The Ball. I'm Ellen Keane with you for the rest of the hour this Sunday as part of my weekly takeover. If you missed my chat with sports writer Joanna Reardon before the break, you can podcast this entire hour of on the OTB Sports app. Just search OTB Sports in your app store now. Next up, I'm delighted to welcome ultra runner Connor O'Keefe, who is taking on an incredible endurance challenge. Connor, welcome to Off The Ball. How are you doing? And cheers for having me on. No problem at all. Where are you at the moment? I'm on Inishmore, the big island on the Arnhem. And are you on a campsite? 
yeah, I'm on a campsite. There's my flipping house there, Vi. That's my house. It's been my house for the last good bones of about a month and a half now. Yeah, so is your staycation just literally travelling all, all over Ireland at the moment? Absolutely, yeah. I was just like, I've never seen the Aran Islands before. All I've heard is good things. So I said I'd whip out and uh, give it an old look-see. And um, it's just been unbelievable. Anybody who hasn't been out here needs to get out here and check them out. You look a little bit blessed at the moment because the weather hasn't been hasn't been the best, has it? it no, do you know what? Yesterday it was unbelievable. This morning I wanted to go to the wormhole. Do you know where the Red Bull lads go to do the diving? Yeah. I meant to go there this morning and it was lashed out of it. And then the sun just crept through at one o'clock and it's been here since. So I'm delighted. Are you going to Are you gonna give it a go later? I, I already went out, went out and jumped off Class. already. Class. So, unbelievable. Besides two sore feet and a wedgie that is just absolutely incredible. It's one of the best things I've done in a long time. Cool. Well, Connor, you've got a bit of a an exciting challenge coming up. 32 Marathon Challenge. Talk me through that. Yeah, so I was meant to do this on the 1st of April of this year. You know that, um, Ellen, that I was meant to do it um, a couple of months ago. But obviously COVID hit and things change and and, uh, we had to kind of switch it around. So uh, in 2021, I'm going to run 32 marathons in 32 counties um, in 32 days with 32 pounds on my back, um, all to raise €100,000 for Pieta House. That's insane. And where did the idea come from? Um, it was a mix of things, but um, I thought I really wanted to, um, I suppose, do an endurance feat. I oh, see my background was I used to do ultra marathons, 100 mile and 200 mile runs. And I said, that's OK, but it's kind of a bit inaccessible and a bit isolated. So I said, do you know what I'm going to do now? I'm going to get out amongst all of the people that I actually want to help. And I'm going to run through every single county and do a marathon in every single county and see everywhere that hopefully, you know, Pieta House and other charities like that can help. So that was the kind of idea was I wanted to bring the whole endurance aspect in what I've been using already to do fundraising, but I wanted everybody to see it. And people who weren't on Instagram, whatever, I was like, what's that flipping lanky dude doing there with weight vests on his chest running through the town? Like, you know, so I think it was just probably the best way to spread the message, you know? Yeah, and your your Instagram has grown so much since people have, have been paying attention. You've just, your your audience has grown so much, hasn't it? Yeah, big time. I like, it never was even on my kind of agenda really whatsoever for for people to follow me on Instagram, but it just kind of happened. And uh, people have just been following along because, I don't know, I think it's just uh, uh, I talk very honestly and plainly about my own life and about the ups and downs and uh, the kind of things that I get up to. And I think people just appreciate somebody who just kind of like tells it how it is. Yeah, and it's like I definitely find watching your story, the, the mental toughness that you have. Where did that come from? How did that develop? Oh, um, well, I suppose my sporting background was in Thai boxing, was in uh, Muay Thai kickboxing. And I started that when I was a teenager up into my kind of like mid to early 20s. And that kind of built an awful lot of the resilience into me. It was beaten into me, literally, um, from like when I was 17, when I first started. And before, even before I was Thai boxing, I was actually mountaineering already at that stage. I climbed Kilimanjaro at 17 and um, after I got back from that, I knew that some sort of a switch had been flicked in my in my brain where it was just going to make it a lot tougher for me to give up on things and um, that I wasn't going to, you know, that I was just going to try and, you know, keep putting one foot in front of the other or whatever that may be in my, you know, in everyday life. Um, and that kind of just transported into ultra endurance. Um, and like anything, it's a skill. It's just like, any, it's a, you know, if a hurler is, is hitting the ball off the wall for two or three hours a day and he's constantly working on his skills, he's going to be unbelievable when it comes to match day. It's the same thing with anything to do with mental toughness, you know, with mountaineering, with ultra endurance. You have to put your you have to put yourself out into those situations where you have to call upon that resilience and you have to call upon that, um, I suppose, uh, the never say die attitude and the one foot in front of the other attitude more and more. And the more you call upon it, it's just like solo in the ball. It's it, it it comes more naturally and it becomes stronger. And is it like an automatic now? Whenever you're struggling and maybe training or doing the long distance, you just keep thinking one foot in front of the other. Yeah, absolutely. Like to be honest with you, that when you're actually in the race, when you're in the race and you're in the pain, I find that actually a lot easier than like 
a day where I've had a shocking day now. I've like, you know, I've gotten clamped or my my boss was late or whatever the case would be. Uh, and I've had a terrible day and I meant to do a training session. And I'm like, that's actually the last thing that I want to do right now. But I have this kind of thing in my brain now where it's like, if I really, really don't want to do something, that is the perfect time to go and do it because when I'm in the race and I'm actually you know 100 kilometers in or 120 kilometers in I'm already in it and I'm in that mind frame already and it's it's a lot more linear and understandable but you throw in everyday life into what you want to actually achieve and what you want to do things don't always go to plan you know it's not a race you know there's not a a number on your chest like you know what I mean there's things that crop up all the time there's sick kids there's bills to pay there's things like that happen all the time so you have to be ready for those things and those are the those are the real things I think that test mental toughness not so much 100 mile runs but everything that leads up until the start line and would you write down and keep a journal of kind of all the things that helped you build your mental toughness or do you just bank it in your brain I think it's just all mental. So when I die, they'll have to crack open my skull and scoop it out and try and see if there's something inside there that they can find. Because I never wrote anything down. Now I blogged and I journal a bit, but I, like it's it's just for stuff that I want to share with people about my experience of running. You know, I ran a, a 324 kilometer race and I blogged about that just to kind of give people like an idea. You know, it's not really a thing that everybody's going to want to do, but it kind of is a thing that a lot of people want to know about. And so I've written about those things. But for me, it was it wasn't about kind of it wasn't about journaling in that way. All it was 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 kind of like, I suppose, like crafting a mind. It's like people like bodybuilders craft a body over time and they and they do certain things and they take care of their body in a certain way that creates that result. That's the same way with my brain. Like I've put it through some awful stuff all together. Like and uh at the end of it all then it pays me back by not letting me quit by not letting me give up I think the fact that you're just so brutally honest with yourself as well helps you help you be helps you build that mental toughness as well oh big time you have to be honest with yourself because um, like it's all part of like being responsible for yourself if you're responsible for yourself and you're accountable for your everyday actions and you're accountable to yourself for training for whatever things you want to do whatever things you want to achieve if you're accountable to yourself and you're honest with yourself about here look but you're not really putting in a lot of effort here you know you said that you wanted to I don't know, learn this instrument, but you haven't picked up the guitar. There's dust gathering on the guitar there over the last six months. So if you're being honest with yourself like that and you're keeping yourself constantly accountable to yourself, you'll start moving forward. Like, you know what I mean? You can only start taking, you know, footsteps forward in what you want to do if, you know, you're constantly accountable to yourself. It's like you have to show up every week for a weekly report to yourself going, here, yeah, this is what I've done. Is this okay? You know, that's, it's what helps, you know what I mean? Keep the keep the train moving, like. Yeah. And what does, so that's your mental training for this challenge and life in general. What does the physical training look like for a 32 marathon in 32 days, in 32 counties, with 32 kilos on your back look like? <laughs> Do you know what? It's like, I think it's a lot more boring than you like, people would think. There's like just a lot of like uh, plyometric work and work on like the amount of footsteps that I take while I'm running and doing like longer runs, shorter runs, interval runs. But like what I would say to people for like the actual preparation for something like that is far beyond the physical really like, you know, Um you have to, what I believe is that like you have to create the mind-body connection way before you ever start the first marathon. So when you're actually in training, or whenever I, when I'm in training and I'm training for this, I'm thinking about marathon number 27. You know, I'm thinking about, okay, how am I going to feel in this time when I'm doing box jumps or when I'm doing um, weighted skipping or any of that? I'm thinking to myself, what are you going to, what are you going to actually feel like? 27 marathons in out of these 32 marathons and I get that into my head and so it makes the training that I'm doing I suppose it's a lot more linked to what I'm doing but it's also putting into perspective for me so when I'm feeling like training is getting tough and training is getting hard I'm really like you're fresh you're fit this is you know you should be able to do this not a bother you know you're going to be 27 28 29 30 marathons in there now at some point and your body's going to want to break down but you're going to keep on going. And, that, and then that's the, I suppose, the positive link towards the brain and into the body. And when you're constantly thinking like that, when it comes to game time, it's not a shock. It's not a shock when I, 
when I feel like shit, like five or six, sorry, I don't know if I meant to curse. Um, if I feel really bad at uh, five or six marathons in, I won't, um, it won't be a shock to me because I'll have already thought about those marathons a hundred times here on train. And are you doing it alone or do you have anyone that's kind of supporting you in training? Oh yeah, I have a coach. I have a coach, Dunica Long. He's um, Fit for Long is his uh, business name. He's my neuromuscular therapist and my coach. And he's kind of basically looked after me since I stumbled in the door a week before my first ever 100 mile ultramarathon. And I said, oh, how you doing? Uh, my friend told me about you. I'm doing a 100 mile run there in a week. Um, can you give me a bit of a rub down? And like, he was just so open and just kind of like, okay, yeah, no worries. And just kind of talking to me about it and giving me kind of tips and stuff that straight away I just felt this kind of bond where he was interested in what I was doing and I was interested that he was interested in what I was doing. And literally since then, we've just been working together. Every big um, event that I've done, you know, 200 mile runs, I ran on my patio in a loop for 24 hours straight um, in May. Um, again, to raise money for Pieta House. He was there. Um, he strapped me up. Um, he was there to, to make sure that I wasn't falling apart, even though I was. But, you know, he was trying to help me not fall apart as fast. And um, he's been there with me every step of the way. That's great to hear. What are uh, some of the extreme challenges that you've done before? Yeah, um, I suppose the first ever time that I touched down on the road of a, of, a, of an ultramarathon, I did about seven weeks training. I literally, I was sitting down for lunch with a mate of mine and I said, oh, we, we had gotten pure into a guy called David Goggins. He's this kind of like ultramarathon runner, Navy SEAL, Army Ranger. We got pure into him and I was sitting down and I was like, we should run a hundred mile run. Check if there's a hundred mile run uh, on in Ireland. And he was like, oh, there's one in seven weeks time. I said, book it, book it right now. We'll do it. Two of us will go up and do it. And seven weeks later, we rocked up to the Connemara 100 mile ultramarathon. And Ellen, I cannot even, like, I can't understate how little business we had being there. Like, we were seven weeks training, green notes, this whole ultra marathon stuff. I had run one marathon before then, and we were basically laughed out of it. No one thought we were going to finish. 55 miles in, they were like, here, lads, if you're going to quit, like, quit early, because we don't want to be out here all night looking after you. So I was like, oh, Jesus, we better move it on. And um, that was the first time where I, like, really got in touch with ultra endurance was that 100 mile race and i managed to finish 28 hours and um, you get 30 hours to do it i did it in 28 hours and it broke my heart and soul but um got there in the end and then the next year it was like oh i've done a marathon i've done a 100 mile run let's see what a 200 mile run is like and um ended up uh, going over to the enduro man 200 mile ultra marathon in may of 2019 and really like didn't have any expectation whatsoever of the race, just kind of said, look, we'll just give it a lash and we'll see what the story is. Um, came up and the race organiser said there hadn't been a finisher since 2016 and that uh, there's only been one person to actually finish the race in under the 60-hour limit. And I said, unreal. Well, if I had a chance before, I have absolutely zero chance now. Um, fast forward... 59 hours and 45 minutes later and I'm the only person to cross the finish line and uh, I became the second person to finish the race in under 60 hours and became the first finisher since 2016. That's insane. How do you feel when you ha when you achieve that? Like what's going on in your head? Um, it's It was unlike any other major achievement that I had up until that date for a simple reason that it didn't it didn't engulf me into this. Um, anything that I've ever done before that, I was like, I've, I've done it. You know, I've done it. This is it. This is unreal. I, when I finished the 100 mile race, I was like, I am literally the business. You know, I can run 100 miles, seven weeks training. That's class. I'm unreal. How wrong I was because of that. Because I literally just completely fell off momentum. I went back into my old way of life after that 100 mile race. I was drinking, I was smoking, I was staying out late and partying and all this kind of stuff. But when I finished that 200 mile race, it was like, that's unreal. But I feel like literally I'm scratching the surface. I'm, I'm scratching the surface of what's actually inside me and what I'm actually capable of. So when I finished it, there was a different type of achievement. It was like an achievement that was opening a door. And it was an opening a door for me to go through and to see what was on the other side. And that's what I've been doing since. And how long does it take to recover after these marathons? Um, 
uh, it took it takes about like after the hundred mile run, I couldn't walk the next day. Could not walk. Couldn't put weight on my actual legs because it was just so destroyed. They had no idea how to go through that type of punishment. So it was weeks. It was weeks and weeks before I was actually um, set. It was about eight weeks after the first. It was two months before I was kind of normal. When I had the two hundred mile race, I physically recovered quicker. But I was so just mentally drained and tired that I kind of needed to give myself a bit of a break. But I actually didn't give myself too much of a break because I went back to the Connemara 100 that I had done the year before and tried to do it again in under 24 hours. And I actually did it in 21 hours. And I I was absolutely delighted because of that, because I was like, all I wanted to do since I crossed the line uh, for the first 100 miles was I want to do 100 miles in under a day and um, managed to do that afterwards. But it takes an awful long time. Um, if you really, like, if I, no, no, in the last, I would say, six months, I've really, really gotten into my recovery. Like, uh, I was climbing, uh, I, cl- I went on a kind of a climbing loop. You, you, you know about it, Ellen. That's what this trip is all about. I went on a loop around the country, climbing the highest mountains in each of the provinces. And each kind of big climb that we did, we do sometimes two-day climbs where we're carrying all our pack we're camping halfway through on the mountain range and then we're going through to the other side and finishing off. And after that, like after each one of them, I give myself kind of two or three days of just, you know, seeing other things, going to other places, going for a dip in the ocean, recovering. And it's so important. And like before it was just, come on, keep going, go, 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 go. But I've seen now that it's actually not that. What it is, is it's selecting your times to do that. It's yeah. selecting times to burn the wick that extra bit deeper whereas no it's not all the time go 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 burn the wick burn the wick it's let's give it give it our best shot here and do this and get this done and then let's recover and recuperate and mentally recuperate and then we'll go on again how much money do you spend on food because you must have to consume a lot of calories like what does your diet look like Oh, here. Well, like for for the last like month and a half, I've been living off of noodles and sardines. I've literally had the cheapest, um, I suppose, diet that I've ever had in my life because each of my meals is 50 cent. F- yeah, f- actually, 49 cent, 14 cent for noodles and 35 cent for a tin of sardines. Put them together and I have my, I have my lunch and my dinner. But um, normal days, like, pff, Jesus, I would eat... I'd eat about 10 times a day um, on like ha- hard training blocks. If I'm doing a hard, tough training blocks, I'd eat about 10 times a day. It would be like, you know, he's, uh, Michael Phelps is always brought up in these type of conversations about calorie intake or whatever the case may be. I'm nowhere near that because like he obviously has a lot more money than I do because he can eat obviously that amount of calories. But uh, yeah, I, it's like basically try and get as many calories into me in a shortest period of time that I possibly can. Are you the person at a party who's just always by the snack table? Oh, absolutely. I am like the guy, there's dip already on my top, like five minutes in. I'm, I'm there now, I've got a fresh white shirt, nice and ironed and pressed. And then five minutes in, there's salsa over it, there's everything all over it. Like, I'm I'm madman for the food, like. Um, you're just an endless pit. Do people, yeah. like, do people tell you that their fridge is, is too full and that, that they need to empty it a bit and you go over and... <laughs> Oh, I'm, if, if there's anybody listening to this right now and needs their fridge emptied, I'm going to be back over on the main lad there in a couple of days. Give me a shout because I'll come over and I'll give you a hand, not a bother. So has the training begun, begun for the 32 marathons in 32 days or what's your plan now till April? Yeah, uh, it's already it's already kicked off. I've started to run again. I had a hip injury for the last two months, so my, me and my coach have just basically tried to get me back on the road for the last kind of two months, and I'm ready to start putting one foot in front of the other, getting back on the road again, getting in shape and getting ready for this because um, it's just been too long nowhere. Well, like to be honest with you, I found some fantastic uh, a fantastic outlet in mountaineering and doing all the hikes and the climbs because it didn't disturb my hip, and I've just found that phenomenal. And I feel like I have flipping legs like a a Tour de France rider now from all the mountains I've been climbing around the place. And I had the old fucking bike out for the uh, uh, well, I was on the Iron Islands as well. So um, yeah, I think big kind of my major train is going to start kind of middle of September and. Um, don't know exact dates yet for Project 32 next year, but I have a good probably seven or eight months of a training block. 
So you're aiming to uh, raise 100,000 euro. Where are you at at the moment? I'm at 32,000, which is very strange because it's 32, you know, project 32. But I'm at 32,000, just tipping into 33,000. So we're a third of the way there already. And I haven't actually stepped foot on the actual thing. No, I've been doing different things all along. I did 100 kilometers on a treadmill in a, in a shopping center. And I did the patio run uh, for 24 hours around my patio. And I've done a few different things like that um, to kind of help boost the money. But um, I really think we're going to smash through the 100,000. Once I get a chance to actually do these marathons and everybody can actually see um, me going through each one of their counties uh, doing these weighted marathons, I think that we're going to smash through that, that 100,000 and do a lot more. And where can people find out more information about your challenge and how can they donate? Uh, it's all done through my Instagram, actually, at this stage. Um, so my Instagram is C-O-K-E-E-F-F-E. C -O -K -E -E -F -F -E. And if anybody wants to check out any of the stuff there or donate some money if they have some, I know that this is kind of strange times for a lot of people. A lot of people are out of work and a lot of people um, kind of don't know what the future is looking like. Even if somebody's out there and they're like, Jesus, I kind of, you know, I like the, I like what this guy's talking about or whatever, you can follow along and... Um, you can follow along the journey up until the 32 marathons and if you find that there's a time um, that you guys can donate a couple of euro then you can do, do it on the link in my bio and have you got any sponsors that are supporting you um i don't really as of yet um have have somebody who's actually like got on board to to sponsor me so um it was kind of one of those things where i was just so um, caught up in actually planning the routes and planning where we're going to stay and where I'm going to eat and how we're going to get everywhere and how I'm going to train for it that I just kind of almost uh, it just kind of didn't you know didn't cross my mind. So now that you've got that little bit of extra time, are you gonna are you gonna try and find a sponsor to help you? Yeah, it would be really nice because that gives more money then at the end to the to the charity. You know, because um, at the end of the day, um, when everything is finished all the stuff that has to be paid for would be taken out of the donations to, to help this, you know. So I want every single cent, every single cent that we raise to go to the charity itself. And um, if if a sponsor can get on board to, to, to do that, like, uh, I, you know, it would be absolutely fantastic. You know, and, they, and they'll be seen by every single county in the country. And you said before, obviously, it was meant to happen on the 1st of April 2020. Does that mean you have absolutely everything planned? Have you, are you ready to go on the 1st of April and now all you have to do is to train? You don't have to do any more planning? Uh, no, I have to kind of basically rebook all of the places that we were meant to stay and um, the routes and stuff are kind of all basically set. Um, so that's kind of a big, a big headache kind of done and dusted. But I just have to set up the kind of other logistical aspects of it again. But that being said, it should be a lot easier this time because we kind of basically we know where we are. So it's, um, I think everything is all set. Cool, that is great to hear. Connor. thank you so much for coming on. I can't wait to follow your journey and hopefully you'll be able to get those donations in and reach your goal of 100K. Thanks very much for having me on. No Here. worries at all. That was ultra runner Connor O'Keefe. Earlier this hour, I was talking to sports writer Joanne O'Reardon. If you missed any of the interviews and you want to listen back, you can podcast this entire hour on the OTB Sports app. You just search OTB Sports in your app store and it, you should find it there. That's it for me for my hour, but there's more on this Sunday's Off the Ball after the break.